I'm Brian Coffey. I'm pastor of leadership and development here at Chapel Street, but also a campus pastor at our South Street campus. But I began a long time ago, um, some 36 years ago, as youth pastor here. Looking back over the now 30, 35 years of student missions, what I've seen is what started as sort of an experimental thing. Maybe this will be good for kids. Maybe we can give them an experience of a different part of the world. Maybe it can challenge them to grow some. It's grown from that to a, to a major plank in our student ministries platform. Here in America, we live in kind of a cultural bubble, a bubble that's, that's very affluent compared to the rest of the world. And so I think it's easy for us to kind of conflate our, uh, our faith with our culture, our faith with our affluence. And I think kids are vulnerable to that. My name's Amy Heavey, and I grew up here at Chapel Street Church. My faith journey in high school really was impacted by these trips and my kind of the first ones, my domestic trips, more urban trips, really showed me that I have faith because I was raised in it, but it is also my job to then own my faith. From those experiences, you realize that people need Jesus just as much as I do, and, but it looks different in the context that you're in. And sometimes I think you can walk in having an expectation or a prediction of how this might look, how I think it should look, but God shows up in totally different ways and then you're changed by watching the people you get to work with be changed as well. Uh, I'm Trent Santi. I'm a 17 year old who goes to Geneva High School and I've been going to Chapel Street since I was in preschool. So I went on the Minnesota mission trip uh, going into my sophomore year and this was the first mission trip opportunity I've been presented with and it was a really awesome experience for me to be able to help create a community garden for the neighborhoods there, being able to set up a VBS for the kids to come in and hang out on my second trip. One of my highlights there was definitely uh, we got the opportunity to go to a train station in the city of in Minneapolis and we were going uh, through the train station finding homeless people to pray over and that for me was an eye-opening experience and something that I for sure can say that I've, I've was given more confidence to be able to go out to the strangers and pray over them. That for sure was something that I could take away from this trip. Through all these mission trips, it's just shown me that no matter the background that someone has, it's, it's God's child and you should love them the same as you love them, your, your brother, your sister, your mom, dad, your best friend. My wife and I, um, years ago, uh, worked uh, in, at Wheaton College, uh, my wife helped uh, as an instructor in a class of Wheaton College students. And so we, for a couple of years, we taught a semester of this class. And we came to believe that at the college level, we could tell upon first meeting a, a, a class of college students, how many of them had had experiences in high school where they'd been overseas. We, we could just tell by their worldview, by, how, by their maturity, by how they talked about themselves. And we, that really influenced me that, that this is really important because you can see it in their lives if they've had this experience. So my name is Tessa Wagner and my family's been going to Chapel Street for about two years now. So I went to Cabo in March of 2023 and this trip was for high school seniors, current seniors, and it was really focusing on how to finish strong so that we can start our next chapter strong. So we stayed in a house really close to Ramon and Vanessia's and they hosted us, they cooked our meals. Ramon is a pastor in that area and they do a lot of local ministry and helping out their friends and my group did a lot of painting and we helped seal a roof. That was a really cool experience just to kind of like get to know the family that we were serving. Thinking about Ecuador and Cabo, what I'm hoping to just remember and stick with me is just how God's, how, how He's worked in those like special moments. Just remembering like the tangible ways that I've seen Him work because I feel like mission trips are a really great way to just like keep your eyes open for God. Missions and experiencing God is forever a part of my life. I would not be who I am today spiritually if I had not gone on any of these missions trips. Our student missions program that's developed over these years has had tremendous impact. You know, our four sons all grew up here at Chapel Street. 
They grew up in our church and they all had multiple student mission experiences in our youth ministries. All of them would say, of all the things that they grew up with in church, among the very most important in their faith stories are student, student missions. And watching what happened in my boys as they had these experiences was dramatic in our family and I'm grateful for those things. Well, uh, some of you know this. I served as a high school pastor here for a number of years before I stepped into the lead pastor role. And some of my very best memories, some of the best work God did in my own life was through those very experiences you saw there mentioned uh, through mission trips. And so we're thrilled uh, about what God has continued to do through our student missions programs, junior high and high school and beyond. And so if you are a student heading out to serve in any capacity this summer, uh, or a parent of a student hang out to serve, would you stand up for a minute? I want to pray and bless you. Yes, we praise God for you and thank for you. Yes. Let's bow together in prayer. God, we thank you and praise you for your work and grace in our lives, and we acknowledge that living in this community, as we heard in the video, sometimes uh, deceives us into thinking the whole world is like this, and it's not. But when we go to serve you outside of our cultural context, not only do we have a chance to impact others, but you bless us by expanding our minds and our vision of who you are and how you work in the world. So protect and bless these students as they go to serve you. Fill their parents with grace uh, and comfort as their sons and daughters go to serve. And grow your church as a result of, uh, of all of this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A number of years ago, I was uh, volunteering as a high school football coach in my hometown, Batavia, with apologies to those of you who live in Geneva or South Elgin or North Aurora or Elburn or wherever else. I, uh, I was coaching in Batavia, high school football. Loved it. Was a volunteer. Had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and was coaching this young man. I coached a defensive line where the men play. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, the young guy named Nick, who was on the defensive line, uh, had zero uh, background in church or Christianity at all, which kind of surprised me growing up in this culture. I mean, no, no understanding at all of what Christianity is, what the Bible is, what the church is. And so he found out that I was a pastor, not just his coach. And he's like, so your other job is a pastor? I'm like, yeah. So are you Father Jeff? I'm like, no, no, not, not exactly. And he said, so uh, what church do you uh, 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 church at? Like, he didn't know how to even ask the question. I said, well, I told him where we, where we were, and he, he started attending. And his older brother, who he wanted to know what he was into, he told me the story of how he was trying to share with his older brother about what he was doing, why he attended this church every Sunday. And it was so funny to me, thinking back on this, because he had no language for it. Like, he didn't have any understanding of what the church is or why he wanted to go there. And so he told me the story. He said he told his brother, he said, well, like, well, his brother said, what do you do? Why do you go there? Well, we sing a, a bunch, and there's words on a big screen. Oh, so it's like a karaoke bar? No, 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 not exactly. There's also a message, which is helpful to our lives. Oh, so it's like a TED Talk? No, I mean, no, not exactly. We also want to encourage each other to grow. Oh, so it's like CrossFit? No, not exactly. No matter what he tried, his brother just couldn't get it. And I think this is instructive to us. What is this thing we're doing? Like, I stand at the door and watch you walking in. What is it you think you're doing when you show up here? <laughs> what, what is the church? What are we a part of? Is it religious tradition? Is it the thing you do because I just grew up in this community? It's what my family does. Is it, are you Christian by proximity? Is it just a cultural thing? What is the church that we're a part of? And what do we think we're doing when we show up here? Well, we're in a series on the book of Colossians called The Fullness of God. It's a letter the Apostle Paul wrote from a prison cell to a small group of Christians in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. My wife and I fly out tonight with a group of chapel readers to this, the country of Turkey to visit some of these places. Anyway, he writes this letter and says to encourage these Christians in being a part of the church. Let's look at uh, this passage from uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, part of last week's message through chapter 4, verse 1, to put it in context for us. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, there's a lot in there, which we're going to walk through, but Paul's writing this letter to a group of Christians called the church. And I want to just pose that question, what is the church? Like my, my young student I was coaching, what is it that we're a part of? There are lots of metaphors used in Scripture. The church is a vineyard, it's a, the, we're the, he's our shepherd, we are his sheep, it's the body, it's a building. One of the questions we should ask of the church is this. Well, how did the first Christians, how did they think about what it is they were doing when they gathered together? How did they understand what they were a part of as the church? One of the most profound images in the Bible for the church is that of a family. And I would suggest to you in this context, this is the primary definition for us this morning, the church is the family of God. This idea is a little bit inspiring and also intimidating. I mean, you think family, yes. I mean, maybe you think the idyllic Norman Rockwell painting, right? A family around a table, loving each other. It looks so perfect. But then we pause and think, well, that's not my family. I mean, maybe you grew up in a family that has some issues. Anybody? Anybody have in your immediate family or extended family a little brokenness, a little dysfunction? Is it only me? Or are you just not willing to say so? Right? We've all got, we've all got stuff in our families, Right? Every, no, no family is perfect, but that's kind of the point. We're brought into a new family by the grace of Jesus. Our families are nothing like the idyllic picture. Neither is the family of God. Nevertheless, this is one of the metaphors God uses to describe. When you come to church, I'm coming to the family gathering. I know I often do this, but it's fun for me at least. Look around the room for a minute. Turn your heads and look, Right? <laughs> These are your family members. I don't mean those sitting next to you that you're like biologically related to. I mean down the row. This is your weird uncle down there. That's your strange aunt. That's your uh, second cousin. These are your family members by God's grace. And sometimes we're in a family with people that go, oh, really? Him? Her? I remember a, young, a guy who told me, he said he was a blue collar guy. Uh, and he says, I wouldn't even like the guys in my men's group if it wasn't for Jesus. Now I love them. I wouldn't have anything to do with them because they're all white collar professionals. But because of the grace of Jesus, I call them brothers. That's what Paul's saying to this church in Colossae. Colossae, you are the family of God. This is exactly how the New Testament describes it. And it's true of our family, our church here at Chapel Street. Let me put it this way. The church is a family of people for the blessing of all families and all people. Now, if you're here and you're thinking, look, I, I, I've had some brokenness in my family. I have some pain when I think about family. Or maybe you, you have you've experienced the pain of divorce or you've never been married and you long for that. The point is, all of us should care about this because we're talking about the family of God of which we're all a part by his grace, whatever our brokenness or our background. And this has been God's plan, not just in the New Testament, but from the very beginning. God calls a man in Genesis chapter 12 named Abram. We know him as Abraham. And he says, I'm going to bless you by multiplying your descendants. I'm going to bless your family, those who come from you, so that your, from your descendants will come the blessing for all nations, all peoples, all families. We bless through you. And we know that from his line 
comes the people Israel and ultimately Jesus. Who puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19, when Paul talks about the family of God. He says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household that is the family of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. You have a new family. You, we are all adopted into a family of God, given all the rights and privileges of being his sons and his daughters. Jesus wants to reframe your identity and your loyalty around himself. This is so crucial for us in the world today because so many of us are framing our identity and our loyalty around the wrong things. Our political identity and loyalties, our sexual identity and loyalties, our gender identity and loyalties, our socioeconomic identity and loyalties. And Jesus says, those things, while they may be real, are nothing compared to what you have in Christ, in him. He is your identity. He is your loyalty. You're part of his family, first and foremost. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul continually points them to the supremacy of Jesus above all things and their identity in him. We saw this last week when he says, you are chosen holy and beloved. This is your identity. You didn't earn it. You didn't create it. It's given to you in Christ. And from that identity then, he says, therefore, put off these things. Put on these things. Live a new way because of the new identity given to you in Jesus. And in the passage we're going to examine this morning, Paul says, okay, now that you have your identity and you know to put off certain things and put on certain things, what does that look like inside the family of God? in the family relationships we're all a part of in different ways. How does the family of God live? We pointed this out before, but when Paul says you here, it's a plural you. We're conditioned to read this individualistically, like this is about me and my dreams and my desires. No, it's you is, is y'all, all y'all. It's a plural you, right? You all are part of the family of God. Do you know who's in this family in the first century? Let me walk through this for you for a minute. There were people called the Sadducees. Do you know what they were? In the first century, Sadducees were those who were uh, sympathizers with Rome. Faithful Jews thought Rome was the, the problem, and Sadducees were, they were liberals. They were cooperating with the problem, the political authorities. The Essenes were separatists. They thought the way to be faithful to God is to withdraw from society and the corruption of the political movements and just be by ourselves and hide away. There were zealots. Remember Simon the Zealot? Zealots were those who thought the way to be faithful to God is to fight against all the corrupt powers, those who oppose us, particularly Rome and its sympathizers. There were Pharisees. These are the hard right-wing, hardliners, right-wing conservatives who thought the way to be faithful to God is to hold the line morally and despise those who don't. Think about these groups, right? Essenes and Zealots and Pharisees and Sadducees all inside the family of God would not associate at all with each other if it wasn't for Jesus. A minute ago I asked you to look down the row. Maybe if you look far enough, you might find somebody who's a Democrat or a Republican who votes different, who thinks different than you do. Doesn't mean that all these distinctions are erased. It means they pale in comparison to what holds us together in Christ. It was true in the first century, and it's true in the 21st century. Can you imagine these people being together in the same family? What would hold them together to love each other and to make a difference in the world? Look at verse 17 of Colossians chapter 3 again with me. This, we, this is last week's, the finishing verse. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do everything. Because this verse really sets the stage for what Paul says next. 
He's going to try to apply this and everything that's come before it to your own family, your home, doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Greek word there, Lord, for Lord, is the word kyrios. It means king, ruler, authority. What does it mean then to live your life under the authority, rule, and reign? Or more specifically, for the authority of Jesus to reign in your house, in your family. Let's look at verses 18 of chapter 3 through verses, chapter 4, verse 1. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents and everything. For this place is the Lord. Some of you like to just lift that sentence out right there. Just pull that one out and say, see? Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Some of you kids are like, uh-huh, dad. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are earth, your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there's no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, some of the words used here can throw us off and cause us to miss what Paul is really saying. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, there were things called the household codes. You may have read about this or studied this. That was commonplace. Paul's doing a couple things. First, he's acknowledging these and then talking about how those in the family of God, how our loyalty and our identity causes us to live differently than what might be the cultural standard of the day. And he's doing this in each of the three primary relationships of the first century. I'll try to talk about these and apply them to our 21st century context. First, husbands and wives in verses 18 through 19. Parents and children, verses 20 through 21. Servants and masters in verse 22 through 4, verse 1. The whole thing is about power and authority dynamics and how all of that is supposed to work under the lordship of Jesus. You might be thinking, well, what about verse 11 of chapter 3 when Paul says there's no more longer slave nor free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. Is Paul contradicting himself? No, not at all. Remember, our differences are not erased in Christ. He transforms them. Let me put it to you this way. Jesus does not necessarily want to erase all social differences or distinctions, but he does want to transform them. Some he'll want to change because they're corrupt and wrong, but some are good and just necessary and just real. But in everything, he wants to transform how we live in the world. Okay, let me just, let's just talk about a couple of trigger words for some of you to get those out of the way. Two S's, as it were. The first one is the uh, slavery. You saw the word bond servant. Some of your Bibles might translate that as slavery. We hear the word slavery and we think about American South and the Civil War and chattel race-based slavery in the U.S. That is not what the Bible's talking about. Nevertheless, the trajectory of Scripture is always setting people free from bondage. So it's moving away from this. However, bond servants could mean a, a whole range of things. People that were in servitude to others for all kinds of reasons. Paul's point here is that we should operate differently. It was an accepted norm of the day. He's saying we should live differently as followers of Jesus. By the way, do you know who delivered the letter of Colossians to the Colossians from Paul? Anybody know? A guy named Onesimus. We know that name? Go read the book called Philemon. Philemon is a, a, a letter written by Paul to Philemon, who's a Greek owner of a slave named uh, Onesimus, a runaway slave who Paul says is set free by the grace of Jesus, gives him the letter of Colossians and sends him back to deliver this letter to the church. It's a remarkable book. He's not condoning slavery of any kind, but recognizing its existence and saying, inside this world in which we live, how do we as followers of Jesus operate differently? All right, second word, S word, submission. Uh, I know some of you hear this and you think, oh, I'd rather you skip this part. I remember doing premarital counseling for a young couple, and the woman said to me, don't you dare say that at my wedding, right? Because she grew up in a home where this was used as a spiritual club, an instrument of abuse. 
And sadly, that's been true. Paul is not talking about power and control and authority in an abusive fashion. He says, we are all under the authority of Jesus. All of us have to learn what it is to surrender ourselves, to submit ourselves. Look what Paul says in a, in a parallel passage in Ephesians. Submitting to one another, that's all of us, men and women, out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. But look what he says in verse 25. Nobody talks about this. Husbands, love your wives. We hear love and think, oh, that's nice. Love. What is he saying? As Christ loved the church and what? Read it with me. Gave, just the men. And gave himself up for her. Men who are husbands or aspire to be one someday, what does it mean to give yourself up? How did Jesus do that? Died. So wives submit, husbands die. Who has the harder job? <laughs> and it does not mean, by the way, like I jump in front of a bullet, or, or I take a bullet for her, I jump in front of a train for her, like some hero. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a profoundly more difficult death. Dying to your need to have your way. Dying to your need to be first, to call the shots. Dying to your selfishness. To say, she's first. Second only to Jesus, above everyone else. Lay yourself down. The problem in our society is we want to focus on what everybody else is supposed to do. Well, she's not submitting. Well, he's not leading. Look at your own heart and, and, and ask, what is God asking me to do? This is the beautiful picture of what Paul is laying out for us, saying, Jesus Christ, who had all authority in heaven and on earth, made himself nothing, surrendered himself to the will of the Father, became obedient, took on the nature of a servant all the way to the cross. That's the model. That's the standard. That's biblical leadership. That's what he's saying to us. The Greek word hupoteso literally means to place yourself under authority, willingly. And we all must do that, every single one of us. Now, the Bible does not anywhere ever say all women must submit to all men. Nope, not in here. But in the context of the family relationships, it's talking about how we operate, how we surrender ourselves. So this call to submission obedience is not grounded in the authority of the other person, but in the gospel. Look at what C.S. Lewis writes in his classic work, Mere Christianity. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions and favorite wishes and every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have given away will ever really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him, everything else thrown in. This is what Jesus says. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is what he's talking about. Honestly, we should be less concerned about the home and more concerned with our relationship to God. And surrender to Christ. Years ago, I was as a youth pastor. I remember uh, this one father of, a, of a, one of the key student leaders was a, he had been to seminary and he loved to debate theology with me. And every time I'd give a message, he'd want to talk to me about it. And sometimes he was encouraging, but more often than not, he wanted to like uh, pick at things that he, th he thought I didn't get quite right. So I'd see him come and be like, "Oh, here we go," you know. And then years later, I found out that he was horribly abusive in his home abusive verbally to his wife and children, even abusive physically. How is it that a man been to seminary, knows the Bible, could live that way? How is it any of us could, could quote chapter and verse, but in our own homes, in our own lives, where it matters most, live in a way that dishonors the very thing we say we believe? This is what Paul's driving at. 
There is to be no such thing as a compartmentalized life for the true Christ follower. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in his name. And work at it all as working for the Lord, not for men. Do all in the name of Jesus. Now, I want to just point out here, the Bible holds its strongest words and injunctions and corrections for those in positions of power in society. That was true in the first century, and it's true today. In fact, this is one of the things that made Christianity so unique in the ancient world. Initially, Christians had no power. They were on the margins of society. They were oppressed and persecuted and on the outskirts. But as they began to grow in number and grow in influence, beginning in the, the fourth century when Constantine becomes a believer, the emperor Constantine in the Roman world, Christians start asc ascending to positions of authority and influence and power. And they use their power, not for themselves like everyone else did, but to bless others. This is a uniquely Christian virtue. Are you a boss? Do you have employees? Do you have people that work under you? Are you a supervisor? Are you a teacher? Are you a coach? Are you a mentor? Do you in any way have people that God has placed in your life where you have some influence or authority over? If so, here's how we're to live. Those in positions of authority should use it like Jesus in sacrificial serving and self-giving. We give ourselves away for the good of others. That's what we do individually. That's what Christ has done for us. And that's what the church is meant to do in the world. You know, in the great movie Braveheart, Mel Gibson, who plays William Wallace, says to Robert the Bruce, the future king of Scotland, there's a difference between us. You think your position exists like the people of this country exist to provide you with position and power. I think your position exists to provide the people with freedom, and I go to see that they have it. <laughs> you hear the lesson in there? Whatever position God's given you, of any influence, exists by his grace for you to bless other people. I repeatedly have to be reminded of that as a lead pastor. What is the point of this? To lead, to be in charge? No. To serve, to bless others. So it is with each of us. This is what biblical leadership looks like in the model of Jesus. In our culture today, there's so much angst over the abuse of power in every area of society that some people are saying, well, the way to deal with this is to get rid of all authority structures entirely, to tear it all down. That's not what the gospel teaches. It teaches that some structures are good and right. The problem is us. We corrupt the understanding of what it means to be in influence as a leader. We twist it out of shape. So those of you under authority are to live like King Jesus, who had all authority, was in nature God, but he gave it up in joyful submission and faithful obedience. Are you in authority over somebody in your life? Parents, teacher, supervisor, coach, mentor? boss, employer, live like Jesus. Use that position to bless other people. Are you under authority? Which, by the way, is every one of us in some way. Live like Jesus. Entry-level job, you don't like your boss? Be easy to lead. Bless those over, over you. Students who think your professor or teacher's an idiot? Probably that means you're the idiot, but <laughs> leaving that aside... Learn from them. Submit yourself to them. Executive leader who doesn't like your CEO, be easy to be led. Committee member, you think the chair is wrong of the board or whatever? In every category of life, inside the home, parents, wives, husbands, children, bosses, employees, employers, in every sphere, every conceivable sphere, the model is that of Jesus. Who does not think my rights, my position, my authority, my power, and fight against my enemies, but lays it all down to bless other people. That's the model of the church. So let's be the kind of employees, employers, students, family members who bless the world because of the blessing we've received in Christ. We are, after all, the family of God.
Paul says in verse 23, you are not ultimately even working for that person. You're working for the Lord. You're serving the Lord, even in your obedience. You're making a difference that way. Every square inch of your life and every relationship that you're in is under the authority and reign of Jesus. That's what Paul is saying to this ancient church, and I believe it's what he's saying to us today. And frankly, I'm more and more convinced that it's the best possible argument for the validity of the gospel is how we live under his authority and by his authority. And what a way for us to finish our, our time together than by coming together to his table where we as brothers and sisters, at the, as family of God, at the table of Lord Jesus, remember through bread and cup. What, what we do when we come together, by the way, as God's people, is we do what Christians have always done. We eat the bread and we drink the cup and in doing so remind ourselves of who he is and who we are because of him. Let's bow in prayer and prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, you have all authority in heaven and on earth. It belongs to you. You are preeminent and supreme of all. And yet we know that you laid all that down and surrender yourself to the will of the Father to go to the cross to give us redemption and freedom and forgiveness and life in your name and new identity and new purpose that because of you, Jesus, we are indeed chosen, holy, and beloved. Not because we deserve it, but because that is who you are and who you've made us in you. And then, Lord, you've called us to represent you to the world. We thank you for what we've received at your cross. It is that which we could never earn by our own effort and do not deserve but you give freely by your grace. We thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. So you take the cup in your hands and on the bottom is the bread and as you peel off that bottom layer and pull out the bread and hold it in your hands, I just want to remind you, you don't have to be a member here of Chapel Street Church or even a regular attender. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then you're welcome at his table because he says that he is the bread of life and this is his body given for you. Eat this in his memory. And as you peel off that top layer, I remind you that Jesus said he is living water. And he said to his disciples and he says to each of us, this is the cup of salvation, the new covenant in his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's drink this and remember him. Lord Jesus, you are altogether worthy, and we are here to bow down and say that you are our God, and ask your forgiveness for when we live for ourselves, and ask for your, your spirit and your strength to live your way in authority and under authority, because everything we do is to be done in your name. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and do everything, whether in word or deed, in his name, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. And go in peace.